Uh, this is Catherine Lambrecht. Welcome to one of the few meetings we've had in the last year, which are on a Saturday. Uh, but get used to it because uh, things hopefully will change and we'll go back to our Saturday morning programming. So our program today is one of those wonderful things that would not have happened if it were not for the Zoom. I, I really like Zoom. I know there's people who hate it, but I really like it. And this program, our, our presenter today is coming from the UK. This would not happen otherwise. You know, I don't know if you travel through Chicago, but we would wait a really long time for those moments to intersect. So I totally appreciate Zoom and, and its ability to bring us people that we otherwise could never meet. So I'm turning it over to you, Sam. Thank you very much. And it's a delight to be here. Uh, I don't travel through to Chicago that much. I, I was there, gosh, about five, six years ago um, on a holiday. Uh, my husband happens to work for a firm that's based in Chicago, but uh, so we did a whistle stop tour, but that was a, a number of years ago now. But uh, so yes, I like Zoom too, because I don't get to meet people like yourselves it, when I'm stuck in England in my home in Sussex, which you can see behind me. I'm hoping it's not too messy. Um, I know the last time I did one of these, someone commented on the wine glasses and decanter lined up. I have to say it's, they're my husband's, they're not mine, <laughs> because he's the wine, he's the wine buff uh, and the wine expert. Although I do obviously get to enjoy um, sampling the wines that he uh, he buys. So um, yes, me, I'm I'm Sam Bilson. I'm a food historian, writer, and cook. I'm based in Sussex, just north of Brighton, for those of you that know England. Um, I'm also the co-vice chair and awards coordinator for the Guild of Food Writers. So um, that's sort of just a pretty pacey of what I, I do. Um, my first book was on the history of gingerbread, as you know. Um, that's what I'm going to talk to you about in a moment. And my second book is on the history of English saffron, which I'm currently researching. Um, so uh, yes, most of my li life is yellow tinged or orange tinged at the moment when I'm testing recipes from old sources. But Kathy wanted me to talk a little bit about my supper club. Now I started this in 2015, basically because I was finding that I was cooking, um, making lots of historical recipes or trying to recreate historical recipes. And I really just wanted an outlet. I wanted to share them with other people. A lot of people would, uh, you know, friends would comment how interesting that was. Um, and, you know, suggested that Supper Club, a Supper Club might be a good platform to sort of introduce other people to dishes from the past. Now, um, the earliest Supper Club I've come across, and I'm going to, Thames Tunnel one. Now, you may have heard of this. This happened on the 10th of November, 1827. They basically um, built a tunnel under the Thames and they helped, this is a, a, an illustration that appeared alongside an article describing the, the dinner. Unfortunately, there isn't an awful lot of information about what they served at the dinner. Um, and I haven't been able to get to the universe, uh, the museum, the Brunel Museum, where the tunnel um, is, is basically underneath the Brunel Museum in London to ask them more about it, but this took place in 1827. So, I mean, the supper club idea isn't new. Um, obviously it was new to me uh, when I started, but the, in terms of a, a modern supper clubs, these have sort of been going, I guess really for the past 21 years, they really started to take off at the beginning of this century. Um, now, how mine works is I take an era, an event, or um, sometimes uh, a particular person and design a supper around that, that theme. So the one I did recently, um, I obviously haven't been able to do them during, um, this is my website. So um, I haven't been able to do them because of COVID, but I did one um, last weekend for the 250th anniversary of the birth of Scottish historical novelist, Sir Walter Scott who wrote Ivanhoe but he also wrote a book called uh, which is not so well known St Ronan's Well uh, in 1824 and this in this book he has a character called Margaret L Lucky Dodds who's basically the landlady of the Clickham Inn and if I don't know if any of some of you may have read St Ronan's Well it's um it's not like I say it's not one of his better known works but basically 
there's a spa town. It's, it was written at a time when spa towns were really taking off. So there's a spa that's been discovered in um, St. Ronan's Well. And they create essentially in what would have been in the early 1800s, a brand new spa, swanky spa hotel. And kind of the, the village is divided in two. And Meg's Inn, the Cleekham Inn, is at the other end of the village. So they've basically taken all her commerce but she's this really formidable character and she has you know she's she's not she's not a major character in the book the book isn't about her at all but she whenever she's in a scene it's um she's she's quite amusing usually chastising the few uh, residents she has staying at her inn. and in, in 1826 christabel isabel johnston wrote a book called uh, under the pseudonym of meg dodds um called the cook and housewife's manual and I really like this book. Um, I think it's got some fabulous recipes in there. It's one of the earliest examples we have of a Scottish cookbook. It's not exclusively Scottish food, but what things that you could say, yeah, these are actually regional dishes from Scotland. Um, and I, many years ago when I was a child, my parents moved to Scotland. So I lived in Scotland for a while. So I, I'm, you know, I think it's a, it's a part of the United Kingdom's cuisine that is much maligned. Uh, I know a lot of people will laugh and say it's all about um, deep fried Mars bars, <laughs> but it really, really, really isn't. And whilst it's not particularly fancy cuisine, it's, you know, there's some pretty tasty stuff in there and there's recipes in this book. So I took the fact that Sir Walter Scott actually wrote uh, a preface to um, Johnston's book and uh, in the guise of one of the characters um and he uh, as a result they, this character touchwood is he's he's setting up a, a, a dining club effectively a supper club you could call it for a few members of the the town that he's managed to convince mrs dodds has a much better um puts on a much better spread basically than the people in the the, the swanky rest the swanky hotel down the road so I used Johnston's recipes to create a menu to commemorate Sir Walter Scott. So this is, these are all based on recipes in the book. So um, there is a, a menu in the book that they give when the, the, the supper club, when the supper dining club, if you like, comes to a close. And there's lots of deviled things, deviled fish, deviled cheese, <laughs> deviled biscuits. So um, the first thing we were gonna, we started with were potted cheese with deviled biscuits and Touchwood's Negus, which is basically a, a, a kind of mulled wine, but he puts a little bit of tamarind in his, which so makes it it's makes it less sweet, but it's it's quite an unusual drink. Uh, and then cockaleeky, which is the, a classic um, Scotch dish where which of, as it says, beacon leaf broth with, I serve it with poached chicken and a prune puree. I've made it, I've, I've poshed it up a little bit if you like. Um, and then say the salmon and the venison pasty. Uh, I mean, I did have to, this one I did cheat a bit I, because normally you'd take a whole leg of venison and wrap it in pastry and cook it. And my oven is one, not that big and two, uh, it takes forever. So I made venison pies, individual venison pies, but the, the, the way I cooked the venison was how um, Johnston recommends in her book. And, she actually says in her gingered neeps, the, the Swede that she, uh, is that what you call rutabaga? I, I think, uh, you have to excuse me if I don't get the right terminology, but uh, it's a- uh, say rutabaga. Rutabaga, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so it's cooked down and pureed effectively, but she says Mrs. Dodds adds ginger to hers. So I put some ground ginger in as well. And then this, the Atoll Bros cake, again, is, is my interpretation. One of the things Meg Dodds, and that's the other thing, I try to pick dishes that are re mentioned in St. Ronan's Well. So the Kokaliki is mentioned as being one of Mrs. Dodds' best recipes. Um, and she makes this thing called a diet cake, which sounds horrific, but it's really not as bad as it sounds. It's a, um, a light sponge. It's a, a fatless sponge, essentially, is what we would call it today. Uh, and I made sort of a, a sort of, whiskey and honey cream and fresh raspberries to serve with it and um, put some toasted oats on top for to, as a nod to the Athol Bros, which is a, a, a Scotch sort of, I guess we call it like a cordial, it's more of sort of a drink rather than um, a dessert, and then coffee and petit balls. 
but uh, most of my events aren't quite, I don't have as many courses as this, but because I hadn't done one for such a long time, um, I really wanted to have a big celebration of, um, of the, the, you know, getting back into the saddle, so to speak, um, with suppers. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's been a long time, I think, for any of us anywhere in the world where we've been able to go out and really just have a normal night out. So, um, yes, so hence it's, I normally do like a, a four, a sort of three course meal, but this was sort of a, a more elaborate meal just to celebrate the, uh, yeah, that we're back and eating and drinking and celebrating and all the rest of it. So um, that's really what I, how I sort of, sort of how I approach um, the supper clubs. I'm happy to talk about this further at the end. Um, my very first one, incidentally, was back in 2015, and I did that to commemorate Magna Carta. So it was an entirely medieval menu. Um, and Catherine and I were just talking about the merits of this, like this uh, recipe book, because it's 19th century. I, they're quite easy to follow to keep to the letter of the recipes, because there are measurements and the ingredients aren't too unusual. Um, obviously you have to scale quite a few of them down because they would have been designed for the large part to be cooked for a large amount of people, hence the venison pasty, as I say, normally would be a leg of venison um, or a big joint of venison at the very least. Um, but uh, yeah, medieval one was interesting because we obviously, you, there are no, well, very rare that you get any measurements or indication of how much you need of spice, uh, of a certain spice. Um, but I love that style of cooking um, because I love spices, which hopefully brings me nicely on to my presentation. Gingerbread is probably one of the first things children learn to make. We love to make it into figures influenced by the tale of the gingerbread boy on the run from his parents and various farm animals. Then there are the gingerbread houses frosted with icing and bedecked in sweets, which have become popular at Christmas, although they bear little resemblance to the original witch's house in the story of Hansel and Gretel, which supposedly inspired them. But what is it about this simple combination of flour, sugar, treacle and spice that makes this confection so alluring? Is it the spicy aroma permeating the kitchen as it bakes, or the tingly heat it gives off when you eat it? or merely the element of fun provided by different gingerbread shapes. One thing is certain, gingerbread has certainly been beloved of the young and old for generations. Queen Victoria even gave her dog Dash some gingerbread for Christmas. As a result, it has a long and sometimes surprising history, as we shall see today. If I were to ask you to define gingerbread, what would you say? Should it be crisp like a biscuit or soft and spongy like a cake? Should it include treacle, golden syrup, honey or just sugar? And in terms of spicing, is ginger really essential? Fact of the matter is that gingerbread takes on many forms, so it's actually quite difficult to give a definitive answer. This is the description provided by the Oxford Companion to Food normally suggests there are exceptions to the rule. In the British Isles alone, there are considerable differences between regional gingerbreads. According to English cookery writer Nigel Slater, it would be wooden spoons at dawn if any single place tried to claim gingerbread as its own. In the north, the oat-based parking is popular, particularly on the 5th of November, when the gunpowder plot of 1605 to blow up Parliament and King James I is commemorated with bonfires and fireworks. Further south, towns like Market Drayton in Shropshire produce a crisper, more biscuity sort of gingerbread. Before the Second World War, one of Market Drayton's gingerbread makers, Billington's, used to sell port alongside its gingerbread, which was reputedly good for dunking in a glass of this fortified wine. One of the earliest forms of gingerbread dating from the 15th century has a curious absence of ginger. And in Wales, they have a cake which translates as ginger without ginger. So ginger, it, ginger wasn't necessarily an essential ingredient. 
In fact, on the continent, ginger is often omitted from spice biscuits, which come under the banner of gingerbreads. In Sweden, for example, cardamom and pepper are often favoured over ginger as a flavouring. The other curious thing about early British gingerbreads is the use of breadcrumbs and honey, rather than the flour and treacle or syrup that we use today. They were also dried rather than baked in an oven. These confections were decorated with a fleur-de-lis made of three box leaves and a clove. Sometimes they would be gilded, and on other occasions it was coloured red with sanders, which comes from the wood of the red sandalwood tree. While researching the book, I tried to make what I believe was an authentic medieval gingerbread. All I can say is that the texture, to my mind, was an acquired taste. Recipes from the late 16th and early 17th centuries sometimes included ingredients like wine and licorice, which again isn't really to my liking. Suffice to say, I didn't include a modern version of either of these in the book, but there is a recipe for honey tart which contains most of the ingredients used by medieval cooks. So where did gingerbread originate? Well, the truth is nobody really knows. Spices were certainly revered by ancient civilizations across the world. Ginger has had a reputation for maintaining health and well-being in China for centuries, and the Chinese philosopher Confucius is said to have eaten ginger at every meal. But finding evidence of spice cakes eaten in the ancient world is a little harder to pinpoint. We know from the works of writers like Athenius and Cato that cakes soaked in honey were eaten in the ancient world, and in the Ulster cycle of Irish mythology, honey cakes were served at lavish feasts, indicating they may also have been eaten by the Celts. While books on, a book on cakes is curiously absent from the culinary manuscripts accredited to the ancient Roman gourmet, Marcus Gavius Apicius, there are a few sweet recipes in the surviving books, including this Dulcia piperata, a honey and nut cake spiked with pepper that I've recreated in the book. Another theory is that gingerbread descends from the Chinese bread called Mekong, which was carried into battle by Genghis Khan's troops. The Arabs and Turks inherited a taste for these sweet, energy-giving breads from the Mongols, and then in turn passed it on to the Crusaders. 13th century abbot Arnold of Lübeck refers to this honey bread as panis melitos, but again there is no mention of any spices. However gingerbread bread came about, it certainly proved to be very popular, particularly among the aristocratic elite. Spices, you see, were incredibly expensive. Serving dishes cooked with spices and often sprinkled on top as a garnish is a way to, was a way to demonstrate your wealth. And what better way to showcase a whole collection of spice, spices than in gingerbread? But gingerbread wasn't only popular because it tasted good. It seems it may have begun life with a bit of a loose reputation. Perhaps the, spice, the inspiration for gingerbread came more from the apothecary rather than the bakehouse. In theory, just about any ailment could be cured by consuming a combination of spices, herbs, honey, and any number of less palatable ingredients. Spices in particular, with their hot and dry nature, endeared themselves to remedies for sexual issues. Spices, and especially ginger, were thought to be aphrodisiacs. Any food infused with spices would be in danger of inflaming passion, or in the case of impotence, restoring it. Add hot and moist sugar into the equation and you're asking for trouble. This puts a completely different spin on the practice of serving spice wines at medieval weddings, other than toasting the happy couple's health. In the Elizabethan era, ginger's hot nature was believed to provoke sluggish husbands, it also helped sharpen the eyesight and combat flatulence. It was during this period that a special event after the formal feast in large households known as the banquet became popular. This was frequently served in a separate room, building or even on the roof. A post-dinner after party, if you like. It was an opportunity to flirt outrageously beyond the wagging tongues of the, of the servants. Invitations to the host banquets were usually extended to a select few. Gradually, this trend would filter down the social scale and soon banqueting houses gained a somewhat ribald reputation. 
these events attracted the eye of 16th century pamphleteer called Philip Stubbs. In his work, The Anatomy of Abuses, Stubbs railed against aspects of popular culture that he believed were immoral and in need of reform of his, if his fellow countrymen and women were to have escape punishment from God. The subjects that came under criticism included visiting prostitutes, lending money at interest, drunkenness and gluttony, as well as the wearing of fancy clothing, a variety of hats available, attending the theatre, playing sports and dancing. He sounds like an absolute barrel of laughs, doesn't he? This is what he had to say on the subject of banqueting houses. In the suburbs of the city, women have gardens either paled or walled round about very high, with their harbours and bowers fit for the purpose. And lest they might be espied in these open places, they have their banqueting houses, with galleries, turrets and whatnot, therein sumptuously erected, wherein they may, and doubtless do, many of them play the filthy persons. The treats served at the banquet were laden with sugar and spices. The purpose was to demonstrate the confectionery skills of the provider, as well as being a display of wealth. These luscious tidbits were designed to tantalise and titivate all of the senses in order to promote the hot and moist humours of lust. It should also be noted that at this time, gingerbread was known as a cake that could comfort the stomach. Even today, products containing ginger, such as ginger nut biscuits, which my midwife recommended to quell morning sickness, are thought to have a calming effect on the stomach. Gingerbread would remain a treat for festivals and special occasions for many years to come, but a slick dark player by the name of Treacle was about to enter the stage and change gingerbread's fortunes forever. In the ancient world, if you were bitten by an animal or perhaps a venomous snake, you would probably send for some Theoraca antidotos, literally the antidote for the bite of a wild beast. It is from this phrase that we get the word treacle. The Roman emperor Nero's physician Adromachus applied the term to a mixture of honey, spices and drugs as a cure-all for venomous bites and poisons. This concoction was still available in the Middle Ages, a steeraca or treacle from apothecaries or treacle mongers. Venetian treacle, an electory reputedly made to Andromachus's very own recipe, was the most costly. Venetian treacle would eventually be usurped by a new electory called London treacle, which used cheap molasses rather than honey as its base. Treacle or molasses is a byproduct of the sugar refining process. So you can see how the, the association of treacle as a medicine could explain why it was slow to be adopted as a culinary ingredient. Poisoning was something of an occupational hazard for the medieval elite. The French king, Charles VII, chose the beautiful Agnes Sorel to be his official mistress around 1444. Agnes is probably the most famous for her daring fashion sense. She popularized the trend of wearing dresses that expose one or both breasts which has been immortalised in paintings such as this. Charles was absolutely devoted to her. So perhaps understandably, their close relationship caused a fair amount of jealousy at court, particularly on the part of the king's son, Louis, who was none too keen on his father's mistress. So when she died suddenly in 1450, rumours began to spread that she'd been poisoned by the Dauphin. Evidently, Agnes loved gingerbread, or panda pieces as is known in France. One theory is that Louis had sent her a poisoned batch to orchestrate her demise. In 2004, Agnes's body was exhumed and significant amounts of mercury in her hair have led historians to conclude that she probably did die from poisoning. However, who poisoned her or how it was delivered remains a mystery. The controversy continued to surround gingerbread in, in France until the 16th century. During the reign of Henry II, gingerbread would again be tented with rumours of poison when talk spread that the Italians were doctoring their beloved pandapiece with toxic substances. It would not regain favour at the French court until the reign of Louis XIV. In, in England, Treacle's transformation from medicine to food came about largely due to the country's colonial expansion during the 17th century. 
Early English settlers in the Caribbean tried growing crops such as cotton and tobacco with some success, but it was sugar that helped make them rich. Colonialists from all over Europe soon realized that the climate in the Caribbean and Americas was suited to growing sugar. Sugar exports from Barbados alone in the late 1640s were worth over three million pounds, making it England's wealthiest colony. Initially, New World sugar was refined in the Low Countries, but from 1544, England began refining its own sugar. This meant that treacle could be produced on home soil. As England's colonial interests expanded, so the price of sugar and treacle would come down. As a medicine, treacle was used, to, as, all, as well as medicine rather, treacle was used to distill rum. But as production of treacle outstripped the demands of both the apothecaries and distillers, it was sold as a cheap, unmedicated sweetener known as common treacle, later simplified treacle. Now, it was not long before honey was usurped by sugar or treacle in gingerbread recipes. Robert May's gingerbread recipe, for example, from the accomplished cook of 1685, clings to the habit of using breadcrumbs and ground almonds, but these are combined with sugar and spices rather than honey. In the 1705 edition of the Family Dictionary, William Salmon records that a gingerbread was made for King Charles II, containing three pounds of treacle, half a pound each of candied orange, lemon and citron peel, and two ounces of coriander seeds, and enough flour to make a paste. So where could you get hold of some gingerbread if you weren't lucky enough to have your own cook to bake some for you? By the end of the 17th century, confectionery shops were bring, springing up in large cities like London, which sold, among other things, gingerbread. Recipes for gingerbread also appear in cookbooks, particularly those aimed at the middle classes, and household recipe books like this example from the receipt book of Anne Blencow. Anne, who was born in 1656, appears to have begun keeping a collection of recipes shortly after her marriage to Sir John Blencow, a judge and later Member of Parliament for Brackley in Northamptonshire. The book has remained in the possession of their descendants. But the place you were most likely to find gingerbread was your local fair. Now, the ancestry of the fair can be traced back to the medieval era when the right to of a town to hold a fair was granted by royal charter. The aim of these charters was to provide revenue for the crown by way of an annual fee, payable by the city or town. Between 1199 and 1350, over 1,500 charters were issued across England to towns like Ormskirk in Lancashire, which is renowned to this day for its gingerbread. The main focal point of most fairs was commerce in terms of buying or selling livestock or hiring labourers. However, whatever the purpose the fair of the fair, those in attendance still required refreshment. In Ben Johnson's 17th century play Bartholomew Fair, there is a hog roast available, a man selling trinkets, puppeteers, and a lady selling gingerbread. Gingerbread has been synonymous with, the fa with fairs for hundreds of years. It was considered good luck to eat a gingerbread piece of gingerbread bought at a fair. Known as fairings, they could be moulded into different shapes and were often gilded. In Cornwall, for example, a proper and complete fairing was a spicy ginger biscuit adorned with lamb's tails, candied angelica, almond comfits and macaroons. If not, the lamb's tails in questions were actually caraway seeds coated in coloured sugar. Bakers of yesteryear have kindly left us numerous artefacts detailing the figures and shapes that were popular in gingerbread. The significance of these moulds is more obvious than others. For example, many pictured patriotic figures like the Duke of Wellington sitting on a horse, or royalty was a particularly popular subject, although sometimes the design for one royal king or queen could be utilised for different monarchs, making it quite tricky to date some moulds. In the early 19th century, a gilded King George on horseback was popular. He was eaten great, with great relish, relish by his juvenile subjects. The oddest mould I've come across is that of a chicken wearing trousers, which you can see in this picture. Now, I apologise for the poor copy of the image, but it was taken through a display case. This is currently on display at Horsham Museum in Sussex, with a number of less unusual gingerbread moulds. 
Now, when I was researching the book, I was unable to unearth the significance or meaning of this image. So if any of you actually know or have any clues, please do let me know. Now, there are detailed instructions for how to make block gingerbread in Frederick Vine's Saleable Shop Goods book from 1898. Often the blocks would be double sided so that the baker could make different sized gingerbreads, which varied in price. Vine also laments the loss of the practice of maturing gingerbread dough for several weeks or months, although I believe this practice is still observed on the continent. Aside from famous personages moulded in gingerbread, there were also generic human shapes sold at fairs and confectioners known as gingerbread husbands. Gingerbread husbands seem to have been particularly popular in the southern counties of England. The Chelmsford Chronicle, for example, on Friday the 14th of May 1847, reports of the Spring Fair that there were upon the stalls rows of gingerbread husbands for the little ladies and on the pavement rows of young gentlemen for the larger ones looking almost as gay, if not quite as soft and tender. Sometimes a gingerbread gentleman would be carrying a stick or an umbrella, and they were often decorated with touches of gold. Founder of the English Folk Cookery Association, Florence White comments, just imagine the child's joy in the gingerbread husband and her grief when the guilt wore off. It was particularly a custom to buy a gingerbread husband on Valentine's Day. Gingerbread wives were also available and are mentioned by John Keats in reference to Dawlish Fair, as well as John Newbury in his 1764 story, The Fairing. However, after the Great War, it was far hard to find gingerbread spouses for anywhere for sale in the UK. Now, there has been some debate as to whether or not gingerbread figures have a more sinister heritage. I did read one article where the authors claim that the gingerbread man can be traced back to the sacrifice of prisoners, knights and foot soldiers. The theory was that baked dough figures were painted in the enemy's blood and that this explains why gingerbread men were sometimes painted red. Personally, I could find no further evidence to support this theory, although the English did have a penchant in the past for using effigies, edible or otherwise, to denigrate particular groups of people or individuals. In England, on the 1st of March, St David's Day, it used to be the custom to hang up or burn effigies of Welshmen, much in the way the British still do with guys on the 5th of November. This was witnessed by what the 17th century diarist Samuel Pepys, who described seeing an effigy of a man dressed like a Welshman hanging by the neck upon one of the poles outside a merchant's house. He describes it as being in full proportion and very handsomely done, although he does concede that it is rather odd. At some point, the effigy switched from being made from straw to the more innocuous gingerbread. This typical drawing from 1786 is actually poking fun at the Prince of Wales, the future George IV and his mistress, Maria Fitzherbert, but it gives you an idea of the sort of image that may have been created in gingerbread. The skewer was inserted so that children had something to hold on to. The description of white parliament implies that the figures may have been made from almond paste, rather like marzipan, or possibly a paler sugar-based gingerbread like those produced in Grantham in Lincolnshire. Although the initial purpose of the fair was business, there was also an element of fun attached to these events. Bartholomew Fair at Smithfield in London, which was established in the 12th century, originally lasted for three days over the Feast of St Bartholomew on the 24th of August. Like many fairs, it had been conceived to sell cattle and merchandise, particularly cloth. But by the time Ben Johnson wrote his play of the same name in the 17th century, the emphasis had shifted from com commerce to pleasure. After the restoration of the monarchy in 1660, the fair would become a 14-day event that was opened by the Lord Mayor of London. Bartholomew Fair, and realistically almost every other fair, gained a reputation for being extremely rowdy, with freak shows like the pig-faced lady and performing animals joining the fray. West Smithfield was nicknamed Ruffians Hall because it was renowned for fights. The fair became so disreputable during the 17th century that Queen Anne ordered it to return to a three-day event. A stall holder in Ben Johnson's play, Lanthorn Leatherhead, accuses fellow vendor and aptly named Joan Trash 
of selling gingerbread progeny made with stale bread, rotten eggs, musty ginger and dead honey. Despite Trash's protestations that her gingerbread is made with nothing but what's wholesome. Leatherhead is not the only person to criticise Trash. Puritan pastor Zeal of the Land Busy accuses her of peddling a basket of popery by nest of images and whole legend of ginger work. Convinced that the fair and its attractions create sinful intentions, fueled by, among other things, Trash's spicy gingerbread, Busy overturns her basket. I'm guessing the good pastor had, had no interest in attending those intimate banquets I was mentioned earlier. But the stallholders did have the last laugh when Busy is putting the stops with preaching at the fair. Despite Queen Anne's hopes that Bartholomew Fair would become less rowdy if its duration was shortened, it became increasingly lawless. On one September morning alone in 1815, 45 felonies were reported at this fair. Consequent public outcry saw the great carnival diminish to a few wild beast shows and a handful of gilt gingerbread booths. By 1840, Bartholomew Fair was a shadow of its former self. After more than 700 years, the final Bartholomew Fair was held in 1855. Joan Trash may well have been fictitious, but gingerbread vendors could be renowned characters. Probably the most famous of these was the 18th century gingerbread seller known as Tiddy Dole, who was dubbed the king of the itinerant sales tradesmen. Tiddy Dole acquired his nickname for a penchant of singing a catchy little ditty using the words Tiddy Diddy Dole, which I'm not going to offend your ears by attempting to sing myself. He made bold statements about his gingerbread, claiming that it would melt in your mouth like a red hot brick bat and rumble in your inside like Punch and his wheelbarrow. Little is known of the true identity or life of Tiddy Dole, but whoever he was, he certainly made a lasting impression and he continued to capture the imagination of artists and writers well into the 19th century. Tiddy Dole was featured in the 18th century prints like this one of the Idol Apprentice executed at Tyburn by William Hogarth. You can see the gingerbread vendor in the bottom right hand corner, brandishing his wares complete with a ruffled shirt, white apron, feathered hat, and presumably, presumably though, gingerbread was a popular snack of this form of public entertainment. In 1806, this satirical caricaturist James Gilray would use Tiddy Doll as a model for his depiction of Napoleon, with an emphasis on the feathered tricorn. As the great French gingerbread baker shoveling gingerbread kings and queens into an oven, Radical 19th century writer and journalist Thomas Frost claimed that Tiddy Doll was so well known that on one occasion when the vendor went missing for a week from his usual stand in the Haymarket, a pamphlet which included account of his alleged murder was sold in the streets by the thousands. In reality, Tiddy had just fancied a change of scene and had left London for a week to tout his wares at a country fair. However, it does appear that Tiddy Doll wasn't popular with everyone. On the 17th of June, 1752, the paper, The True Britain, announced that the famous gingerbread seller had been found murdered in Chelsea Field. His assailants had made off with 20 pounds, quite a considerable sum in the 18th century. For many, the ability to sell food on the streets was a godsend. An Irish sailor called Daniel Cleary began selling gingerbread nuts after the loss of his leg during an engagement on the salt seas. Now, Clary's gimmick was to sell gingerbread nuts by way of lottery. Endowed with the gift of the jab, get gift of the gab, Clary assure, assured his customers that his lottery was no South Seas bubble. And there were no blanks in Clary's game. Every player would win and receive a prize. Clary boasted that some of his gingerbread shop was so highly seasoned that they were as hot as the noble Nelson's balls when he last peppered the jackets of England's foes. A bit of banter certainly helped oil the wheels of commerce. Perhaps I should take a moment to explain a little about old style gingerbread nuts. Now, one of the things that's always perplexed me about ginger nuts is how they got their name. The modern ginger nut biscuit is based on a mixture of golden syrup, granulated sugar, combined with flour, butter, and ginger. No nuts are usually harmed in the making of a ginger nut biscuit. Nigel Slater describes them as being crisp, 
hot and addictive and as being as hard as a brick. I certainly agree with the addictive comment and they are probably one of my favourite biscuits. But it appears I am not alone. Although the sales of ginger nuts have fallen in recent years, they remain one of the country's most popular everyday biscuits. Its firm nature does make it great for dunking in a cup of tea, which may explain why ginger nuts has remained so popular. However, in the 18th and 19th centuries, gingerbread nuts were taken on a slightly different form. They were still hard. In fact, some recipes I tried were proper teeth breakers. The nut reference refers to the size and shape of the biscuit, which were usually rolled into a ball the size of a walnut. Fortunately, some recipes produce a more forgiving biscuit like these hunting nuts from Mary Ann Dixon, the wife of the rural at Dean of York, dating from the mid 19th century. They have been described as traveling biscuits, probably due to their durable nature or the fact that ginger was believed to be too good to quell nausea. But back to Daniel Cleary and his gingerbread lottery. The lottery took a form of a box with strings attached to the bottom. For half a penny, you pulled a string and a doll's head would appear in one of the variously numbered 27 holes. If you had chosen the same number that the doll appeared in, you would win 100 gingerbread nuts. If not, you were still rewarded with at least seven gingerbread nuts. Ever the self-assured salesman, Clary had no qualms in stating that his nuts were far superior to those of the famous Tiddy Doll. In fact, his wares were so fine that should any one of his noble friends prove so fortunate as to draw the, a prize of 100 of them, he would be entitled to those of half the usual size, so delicately small that they would be no bigger than the crack doctor's pills. I'm not entirely sure the customer was getting a good deal here. However, the gingerbread lottery must have been fairly commonplace as it was mentioned in the popular musical comedies of the day. Tiddy Dole and Dan Cleary may have espoused the virtues of their virtues of their goods, but the quality of gingerbread was often in question. An article in Punch from 1845 on the revival of the Brook Green Fair sums up how the attractions of the salesperson could potentially distract from the quality of the goods being sold, in which the author declares, poor maiden, thought the youth, if thou wert sent with thy long curls and low neck blandishment to wake attention to thy canvas mart of gingerbread, thou knows little of the art, for though thy lips should sweetly counsel by, those nuts look far too dusty, stale and dry. With the exception of Tiddy Dole's success, it seems that selling gingerbread was not a lucrative business, with some commentators believing it reaped little financial reward as the profits made were generally spent on gin and hot suppers. I've even read articles from the mid-19th century of gingerbread sellers being accused of picking the pockets of fairgoers who refused to buy their wares. Of course, you didn't have to take pace in a gingerbread lottery to go or go to a fair to get your fix of gingerbread. Confectioners across the country made and sold gingerbread all year round. You may remember, for example, Mr. Dick in David Copperfield by Dick Charles Dickens, who was very partial to gingerbread, but was only allowed to purchase one shilling's worth a day from the local cake shop. These, art, these artisans were very protective of their recipes. The original recipe developed by Sarah Nelson in 1855 for Grassmere gingerbread is kept under lock and key to this day. And in the late 1950s, Bill Cox, the owner of Chester's prized gingerbread in Market Drayton, would tell a local journalist that no one is allowed to be about when I'm making gingerbread. But even towns which weren't renowned for a specific type of gingerbread could get this, could support a number of purveyors of this confection. For example, the small market town in Horsham, at the Horsham in Sussex, where I grew up, had 10 gingerbread makers in the mid to late 19th century. Confectioners like Abraham Chatfield, whose shop you can just see in the bottom right hand corner of this old picture, would have his gingerbread and brandy snaps delivered to the villages surrounding the town by pony and cart. Gingerbread was sold at the last ex execution to take place in Horsham in 1844 when John Lawrence was publicly hanged for the murder of police superintendent Solomon. The spectacle attracted sightseers and peddlers from miles around. 
In a slightly morbid twist to the tale, the murderer's body was exhumed when Horsham's jail was demolished in 1845 and exhibited at the stables of the Queen's Head Public House at the price of two pence for admission. But I don't believe those tickets included a piece of gingerbread. So what of gingerbread today? Well, as we have seen, the, the dawn of the 20th, 20th century, uh, figures of, by the dawn of the 20th century, the gilded figures of yesteryear began to disappear from fairs, being replaced by newfangled confections like candy floss. The fairs themselves changed as well, with a greater emphasis on steam-powered merry-go-rounds. In 1924, the English novelist Sheila K. Smith wrote of the stalls at the fair being more utilitarian in nature, selling things like balls of string rather than ribbons and gingerbread. The Great War had a profound effect on all aspects of culture, of British culture, and it was probably the final nail in the coffin for the classically moulded gingerbread. In 1917, the last Horsham gingerbread baker, George Lovkin, died. Fortunately, his moulds eventually made their way to Brighton Museum, so they have been preserved for posterity and are now on display in Horsham Museum. Other towns, of course, fared better. Gingerbread is still being made in towns like Market, Market Drayton and Ormskirk, ensuring their own town's gingerbread tradition is being preserved. But despite the social and economic challenges, gingerbread never entirely disappeared from our lives. Although Florence White feared that the charm of England's cookery was being completely crushed out of existence by the nation's fascination with foreign food, gingerbread has stubbornly clung on and continues to appear in recipe books to this day. There are even people out there writing entire books on the subject. You may not be able to buy gingerbread at a fair today, but you can visit entire cities made from gingerbread, like this one created by the Museum of Architecture in London at the end of 2019. Some towns go out all out to celebrate their gingerbread heritage, like Market Drayton with its ginger and spice festival, and Ormskirk, which hosts an annual gingerbread festival. And all is not lost for Horsham's, thanks to Leslie Ward, who has created a gingerbread based on a recipe she found in a book belonging to a member of the Shelley family. Well, that's all for me. Thank you very much for listening. It's been a pleasure to talk to you today. I've only really touched on the, surf the surface of gingerbread's history, um, but if you want to learn more, you can obviously read it in my book, or if you have any questions now, I'd be more than happy to answer them. Uh, in the meantime, happy dunking. But we do have a question actually, but it's about the first part of your talk while we catch up and get the, uh, let me make you. Uh, so going back to your, your supper club. Yes. Uh, how many, so this is from Marini. She's asking how many people do you have at your supper clubs usually? When I do them here at my home, um, I only have 12 people because I, 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 I have, have, well, I have a nice house, but um, I, I can only accommodate 12. So they're very intimate events. Uh, it is a communal table. I don't do separate, um, you know, I don't do separate sittings or uh, like tables of the individuals. You all sort of club together um, on one table. So yes, it's, it, I'm not gonna lie. It's a bit of a squash and a squeeze, but everyone seems to enjoy it. So. It's very convivial. Oh, that's therefore. I have done larger events though. So um, if I go outside of my house, uh, so just literally just before lockdown, I did one at a place called Raynham Hall with, for the National Trust, in, that's in Essex. And they had an Elizabeth David exhibition on. Well, actually, it's not fair. They had an Anthony Denny exhibition on. And Anthony Denny was an, uh, one of Elizabeth David's photographers. It's one that the gentleman she worked with most closely uh, she wasn't very keen I believe on um, food photography but uh, so they had a small part of that exhibition was de dedicated to Elizabeth David and they asked me to do an Elizabeth David supper club so, yeah. wow uh, that was uh, okay I, I happen to really enjoy Elizabeth David so just roughly what would have been on the menu if you oh, happen to recall you asked me this is nearly two years ago oh no, okay well <laughs> sorry 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 maybe another time <laughs> it's fine i'm trying to think because it was it was march uh what did we do oh goodness um yeah i can't remember i know i know because i did a lot of research i went to the british library and i looked at a lot is it on your website 
the menu? It, it's not anymore, but I can send it to you. I can certainly that send would you be, That way. would be fascinating. Um, um, so uh, here's an additional question. Is beef traditionally used in Scottish cockaliki or is it chicken? So the, the stock, when you read um, the recipe in Crispo, uh, in Johnston's book, it, the, it's a beef stock but you poach the chicken in the beef stock. So the idea is that you poach a whole boiling fowl and then you portion it up and you serve part of the fowl of the chicken um, with the, the leek and, and beef broth, but it's cooked in a beef broth. It, is, it sounds bizarre, but it's, it's really nice. And, and the same person, but she said she might have missed this, but what are neeps? Uh, neeps are uh, rutabaga. Uh, it, it's, oh, uh, okay. Yeah, so a rutabaga is, um, so it's, so in Scotland, yeah, they, they call them neeps, but uh, in England, because in England, we would call them Swedes, but they, I don't know why we call them Swedes. <laughs> I have no idea why we would call them Swedes, and because they're not a turn, they're different, just, I guess they're part of, possibly part of the same family, um, but they're, they're a root vegetable like a turnip, but they're definitely not a turnip. They're a bit sweeter when they're cooked. So, okay, so th this is just more of a comment, but this person says she enjoyed gingerbread in the Netherlands, as in Abraham cake, or in Nuremberg at Christmas. Do yeah. you have other, I, I know yours is more, let's say, UK centric. It's more UK centric. I did try to, I had planned when I, the book was commissioned, I had planned to um, travel more and I wanted to go to Europe. I really wanted to go to Poland, to the museum in Tehran. Um, but I, I clearly can do that because of COVID. Uh, so I do touch on, I, I mean, I, I very, very fleetingly touch on um, Dutch gingerbreads and the Nuremberg gingerbread. There's a recipe for Elysian Leberkuchen, which are, it's a particular type of Leberkuchen. It's, it's a, it was a recipe I particularly like because it's got lots of nuts and happens to be gluten-free, although it wasn't why I put it in the book. I just, I, I love nuts, basically. And it had two types of nuts, and so that one did, it floated my boat. But I tried, most of the recipes in the book are British, and most of the information in the book is about Britain. I mean, I could write a whole separate, I could probably write a book, to be fair, or someone could write a book on each country's gingerbread. Um, because, but I just, I wanted to put a few example recipes in there so people could see the differences between British gingerbreads and European gingerbreads. Because ours, because we still rely, we rely heavily, most of our gingerbread recipes rely heavily on um, treacle. Whereas uh, on the continent, honey is still popular. So they, they, they're quite different. And the spicing element as well. I mean, apart from the ginger cake without ginger and um, the 15th century version, most English gingerbreads have ginger in. Now. And, and here in the United States, we rely on molasses. Yeah, uh, and someone did ask me in the last time I did, uh, did this presentation what the difference is between molasses and treacle. I have to confess, I don't. I, if I, I had molasses, it was many years ago. I think. I mean, they're basically. I I always say they're essentially this. You can exchange light for light, but I believe molasses may be slightly more bitter. But, um, but yeah, I mean. I don't, yeah. I, I once went to a program we did side by side with Lyle's golden syrup, the different kinds of um, molasses. I think there was a treacle presence. There was cane syrup there. Yeah. It was, I learned a lot and I really like Lyle's after that. <laughs> yeah, it's, um. so I know, um, I, some of the one of the problems, well, not problems, but one of the things when you look at the old recipes is that obviously a lot of people think, oh, that if they don't like treacle, they can they can just substitute golden syrup. And I guess from a textural thing, it probably wouldn't make a difference, but it's a completely different flavor profile. And it wasn't available in the United Kingdom until I think something like 1880. So the my my ginger nut biscuit, which is is kind of an amalgam of several recipes in a book that I have called the Indian Cookery Book which was written by a 35 years resident. It, it, of, it, basically, I am assuming someone who was working for the, within the British Raj has a recipe in there which uses a sugar syrup, but I did use, for that, I did use golden syrup because it, the sugar syrup just didn't taste as nice. Golden by the way, um, question from Randy Schwartz, who before, before we went live, we were talking about repast 
the journal yes. that he um do they say it wrong that he edits yes so. hi randy <laughs> nice <laughs> to, nice to put a face to the name yeah well he was speculating perhaps gingerbread nut was originally gingerbread not k-n-o-t and uh, from the shape before it was flattened and baked i don't know um where's the question it's in the chat oh gingerbread nut uh could have been i guess i think it's because i the reason i put the um the example of uh, Dr. Kitchener's recipe up is because he actually he's one of the a lot. Of, he's not the only one, but his is quite a detailed recipe for the time. Um, and they they most of them do say roll it into the size of a, a walnut or a, you know a nut, um, which I've always interpreted to be a walnut. I mean, you most mentioned a walnut, but it could. I mean, it could have been they had like jumbles and knots and things like that uh, earlier, but the early forms of gingerbread it's like a paste it's quite a as i said it wasn't i i've met plenty of people food historians who absolutely love it but i i couldn't get my head around it i'll be perfectly honest i think i've got a berry prianiki in there which is based on a russian recipe which is like jam and breadcrumbs and that's as close as i was going to i, I could get because i really didn't get on with medieval gingerbread maybe maybe i need more practice maybe i need a time machine to go back and try it and be convinced but it's it's quite an odd texture you wouldn't I don't think you'd be able to mold it into a knot because it's quite loose until it's dried and then it's just weird <laughs> after that. Well, it, it actually in the chat, there we're sort of hung up, but somebody also mentioned sorghum as a substitute for molasses. And then okay. somebody mentioned that treacle and molasses are byproducts of the rum process from pure sugar cane, where sorghum is from a plant, which is grown in our region and well, they're not, it's, it's actually kind of difficult to come upon. Uh, do you enjoy Indian gingerbread? Uh, you mentioned your, oh, you, uh, you enjoy Indian gingerbread. Did you share the recipe? Is that in your book? It's in the book. So uh, if you bear with me, I saw my bookshelf is just here. So I'll see if I can find the book where I found all the rest. The, it's not an original, I, um, unfortunately. So this book here called the Indian Cookery Book. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is literally by a 35 years resident. It's basically anonymous. Um, there are a number of recipes in here for Indian gingerbreads. But when I say Indian gingerbreads, now what you have to bear in mind is that these this style of book were, were written for people living uh, in India and who wanted, for the most part, to cook English food in India rather than Indian food back home. This one's quite unusual in that the curry's in here. And this is, I've used this one a lot for my, when I do my British Raj supper clubs, are actually, do look like a curry, well, similar. I have to, you have to be careful, don't you? But it's, they're not, I wouldn't say they're authentic, but they're more authentic than typical Victorian curry recipes. They're not all just about curry powder. So um, the recipes, the gingerbread bread recipes in here are most definitely English gingerbread recipes that were being made in India for people. I'm guessing this person worked for the government or of some description. Um, but uh, the other one that's quite popular is Culinary Jottings in Madras by Wyvern. Um, that is, to all intents and purposes, that is like reading, almost like reading Mrs. Beaton's or Eliza Action. It's, it's all puddings and, and uh, ragouts and, now, now this reprint of this book is that easily available maybe something uh, you can find yeah on the internet? i mean I, I got it i think either through amazon or a books it was published in 1880 um i, I mean again i can i can send you the details Catherine, so you can share yeah it and, and there actually is quite a bit of interest on what was with with the elizabeth david yeah. related uh, event yeah, I can oh. I can send you. Um, I mean, uh, with that, I mean, obviously, the closer I get, the the more recent I get with the supper clubs, the more closely I stick to the recipes. So with Elizabeth David, I'm not changing apart from quantities, and that occasionally I. But, but some of her recipes were sort of you know loosely interpretive. They were, but I mean, uh, for the most part, I'm I'm sticking to them pretty religiously. 
Um, this period, sort of Victorian, it depends because some people are better than others. Uh, this one's actually very good. So in this recipe, I'm trying to find the gingerbread recipes, but it's like all these books, your gingerbread recipes are tucked away in some random chapter that has nothing to do with anything else baking. But um, they have, there's about four or five in here and I took elements of a few because some of them had, for example, had cayenne pepper in, um, some use pistachio nuts. So ingredients that perhaps weren't, that they weren't available in England at the time, but perhaps were more readily available in um, Calcutta, where I'm assuming this person was resident because it was published in Calcutta originally. So, but, um, uh, so fascinating little book if you can get hold of it. I say I, I, I have seen an original from 1880 at the British Library, but I don't own one yet. But uh, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if it's this, but somebody asked if, I, I, you know what we're going to have to do, because there's enough little details that people are interested in, that what I'll do is, once I have the information from you, I'll just add it to the uh, program announcement at the bottom, so you can yeah. pick that all up. Um, but they were also asking about the name and the author of the culinary jottings. Uh, yeah, culinary jottings, I think, is... Um... It, it goes by Wyvern, and I'll type that in um, to, but um, it's General or Colonel Herbert Kenny, I think is his proper name, but it's part, it's usually Wyvern. Yeah, well, there you go, Priya, thank you. Um, yeah, so it's Culinary Jotting in Madras or from Madras by Wyvern, but I for a source, because I wanted to make, um, when I've done the supper clubs, I wanted to make more, I wanted to make recipes, the food that would be more like that, what they would have been eating in India rather than what English people were eating at home in England as their interpretation of Indian food. Um, and um, so I, that's why I sought out the book that I just showed you uh, because the recipes in there use things like fresh ginger. Um, although if, interestingly, Liza Racton, when she writes about curry, she does mention fresh ginger. So I'm assuming you probably could get it, but I, I, Imagine it wasn't widely available unless you lived in a city like London or perhaps Bristol, perhaps. Um, but uh, yeah, so I've, the fun thing was when I did the first one I ever did, I, I got asked a lot by my guests, do we have to dress up? And I'm always like, well, it, it's entirely up to you. I mean, I, I don't put fancy dress on because I'm cooking and it's, it gets hot in my kitchen, uh, not to mention the, the fire risk. So, um, I, but I had on that occasion, I had uh, four people turn up in period costume for the um, British Raj supper. So the gentlemen turned up in military uniforms with pith helmets and, and the girls had the Edwardian clothing on. So quite fun. Most people don't do that though, I have to say. <laughs> it was quite cool, um, but yeah, it's, uh, and that's one of my, it uh, has to be said, when I've run those ones, they're very popular. The, us Brits love, love a curry, love spicy food. So um, they're always popular. Um, By the way, when you, if you, if you, just as a side, but you've been working with much older recipes. What's hmm. your approach to working with them? Do you start with like trying to make it as it is, or do you start to look for contemporary recipes that parallel it? It depends. So, um, if you take like the stuff from the form of curry, you literally pretty much just get a list of ingredients. Um, so there's no indication, occasionally, but very rare, is there any indication of quantities? And in any, in any case, if there is a mention of a quantity, it's usually so vast because that those manuscripts were written, obviously, for large households, in, with large households in mind. So I guess I do, if I think there's something that's similar, then in the modern parlance, I will look at the quantities used, but for the most part, especially when you're dealing with medieval or Roman, you're, you're, it's just guesswork. And I think it's just, if you've cooked, I've cooked for such a long time and I've always liked spicy food. So um, my parents lived in Singapore before I was born. So I think when they came back to England, um, they sort of brought with them a love of spicy food. So I've grown up eating spicy food and cooking it thanks to my mum. So, um, I think it's just trial and error. I mean, sometimes you put, I suppose I err on the side of caution rather than putting too much in. Um, so I'm currently writing a book on saffron and the quantities of saffron in some of those old recipes is, I, I would bankrupt me. I, I, 
I just couldn't afford it. So I have to be a bit, I have to be a bit mindful or scale them right down to make sure that I can, I'm not, yeah, not having to take out a second mortgage on my home to, to pay for all the rest ingredients. Well, since you're using saffron, what is your preferred saffron? Well, at the moment, I'm trying because I'm writing on Eng England English saffron, so I'm trying to use English saffron. Um, and I think a, a fellow Guild member, Guild of Food Writers member, sent me a, a, a very kindly sent me a tin of, I think it's Spanish saffron, because um, she has a restaurant and she knew I was writing the book, um, which is. Uh, but I've been trying to use saffron from Cornwall, Essex, um, Norfolk. And Kent, I discovered the other day, um, in fact, earlier this week, I was down in Kent visiting a saffron grower. grower. And yes, I, Priya, I am using set of Cornish saffron. I was there a few weeks ago um, visiting um, the saffron plantation down there. Um, but it's, uh, yeah, so I am trying to use English saffron where I can, but of course they, they, they're producing it on quite a, smart, a small scale. Um, so they run out quickly. Uh, so I was lucky to get hold of Cornish saffron. Uh, I've used Norfolk saffron in the past, but I'm currently out of Norfolk saffron. I'm having to. Uh, it's grown in um, sort of Cornwall. Cornish saffron at the moment, I believe, is only grown on the Roseland Peninsula. So not far from St Moore's, if you know Cornwall. Um, I stayed in Redruth when I went down there, which wasn't too far away. Um, because I was visiting the archives as well when I was down there doing research. So uh, yeah, that was, <coughs> that, that was, yeah, I think it's about 20, 30 minutes from Medruth, but yes, right down the Roseland Peninsula. So it was awful weather the day I, I went to visit them. Really bad weather. I know you probably think we always have bad weather in the UK, but we've had some lovely weather and that particular day, they were telling me they could see the sea, but you couldn't see the sea. You couldn't really see much beyond your hand in front of your face. Um, uh, Among yeah, there is a long, yeah, yeah, there is a, yeah, we, it used to be produced. So um, the, my interest began, my, my, although I live in Sussex and have done most of my life, my parents were originally born in Essex near a town called Saffron Walden. And Saffron Walden uh, is, uh, yeah, is funny enough, it is now being grown again, but Saffron Walden was the hub of saffron production in the UK. So it used to be called Chipping Walden. And then we think around the late 15th, early 16th century, it changed its name to Saffron Walden. So um, saffron uh, was grown there and it was used extensively in medieval cookery in this country. And that's my, because I'm a food historian, that's why the angle I'm looking at it from. I know that has, I have heard that it has been used as a dye, although the limited stuff I know about that, there has also been some suggestion that it probably wasn't used that extensively as a dye because it, you know, you need quite a lot of it. Cre creates an amazing color, but if you're putting a small amount in food, that's one thing, but to dye, you know, reams of cloth, that would have been quite an inexpensive outlay, but uh, it could have been used as a dye because so, Essex at that time was very much renowned for cloth production. So, um, yeah, so who knows? But I'm looking at it purely from a culinary perspective. But it sort of had its heyday from the 16th to and 17th century. And then by the 18th century in Saffron Walden, they'd stopped growing it by pretty early in the 18th century, actually. So by the 1720s, it's, it's a rarity in, um, in Essex still grown, I think, at that time in Norfolk and Cambridgeshire. Um, hard to say with Cornwall. Uh, they definitely grew it down there for sure, but I don't know whether um, they were bringing more in, perhaps ex importing more, because obviously back in that, that period we're looking at, they, their ports would have been far more important in terms of export, importing goods into the UK uh, or England than they were they are nowadays. Um, but the tradition of growing saffron has been revived in the last sort of 21 years, I'd say. So Sally at Norfolk Saffron has been doing it since 2009, 10, something like that. Um, David Smale at English Saffron, which is in Essex. They're, they, they're going to visit them the, the end of this week. He uh, has been doing it for about 10 or 11 years. 
the guys in Cornwall have been doing it since 2015 and the chap Andrew um, Bodie that I saw in at Kent Saffron he started in um, 2018 so this is his second proper year of harvesting saffron he planted in 2018. Um, so it's a revival then, of the saffron growing yeah. craft. Yeah so that's kind of what I did with the gingerbread book it was interesting well for me with the gingerbread it was the fact that it's never gone away I suppose with gingerbread I think that the thing that happened with gingerbread is that we just it just became so normal so commonplace that people just don't really pay any attention and I couldn't believe no one had looked into the history because it's been around if you look at any cookery book if it has it's, it's something sweet in it the chances are it doesn't matter how far back you go quite often it's going to be gingerbread or a spice biscuit of some description um, in, in England anyway so uh, I wanted to look at that and that's what kind of the saffron books a bit like that and it looks at how it was produced and why it was popular and then it's decline and revival so um, slightly different but uh, yeah similar similar approach. Um, so what were the primary motivations for these new British saffron cultivators rather than importing mass grown is most of this where is most of this outside of what you're doing in England, but where is most of the saffron coming from? So saffron, modern saffron um, that we get in Europe, um, and I'm aware that you've got a number of saffron producers in, in the US, um, but uh, in Europe, most of our saffron comes from Spain. Um, but I understand that uh, Iran is actually the largest producer of saffron. That's what I've heard. But I think a lot of it gets exported from Iran to Spain and then repackaged as Spanish saffron. It's my understanding. I'm not really looking at that side of things, but that has been my understanding. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's it's bought pretty much. I mean, it's it's available. We don't have our climate in England, even with global warming, isn't what you would say, tip, what you would necessarily say was a typically um, good for growing saffron. We, we're not, you know, we have quite high rainfall, obviously, um, and uh, not too bad in the south, like Cornwall and certainly the guys in Kent uh, probably have quite mild climate. The guys in Kent, I'm surprised are growing it because his soil uh, is quite clay, is clay. Um, so he's doing really well, although the top, he did say the top couple of inches is, it's like silty. Um, where I am in Sussex, I, I have the South Downs, which are made from chalk, which are lovely. I'm probably be perfect growing saffron on, but where I actually am at the foot of the Downs is solid clay. You could literally build bricks from my soil in my garden. Um, I think we could go on and on and on about saffron, but just sorry. to make sure we cover this. So what were the motivations for those growing the British saffron cultivars at this point? Now, it's hard. I mean, so, like, so um, Andrew, who I went to visit Kent Saffron, he, um, his wife is um, of Thai origin and, oh, she's Thai, she was, she's Thai and they, um, they have a jasmine farm in, in Thailand. And then he decided that uh, that, that was productive at certain times of the year. And he wanted, he was coming back over here. He's actually uh, an ecologist, I think he said, uh, and wanted to do something over here and his uncle, it's a family farm, they had some land to spare and he thought he'd give growing saffron a go. Um, it's just, yeah, I think again, Cornwall, I think it's just part of their heritage. And I think it was a bit like me, couldn't, you know, thought, well, why not give it a go um, and see, you know, it used to, obviously used to be grown there. And the Cornish bun, the saffron bun is, you know, everyone who goes to Cornwall kind of seeks those out. That has to be said if you do visit Cornwall anytime do make sure you get them from a reputable source because a lot of bakers don't use real saffron I think they may vaguely waft a packet of saffron in the vague direction of the dough but uh, a lot of the time it's yellow food coloring but uh, there are places that do still make traditional saffron buns I hope lovely. you'll come back to us when your project is I finished. will I'd love to I'd and love to. you know what and, and as I pointed out to you many years ago culinary historians in our uh, Scott Warner's online right now, uh, we did host the uh, Cornish uh, Society of Chicago. And I'll make a bet, maybe when you're available, maybe we could do a joint meeting because they'll be just as interested in this whole Gosh, yeah, absolutely. question I mean, about saffron. I think uh, it's, I mean, you, you all know, I mean, when you look at any subject, 
you think, you know, I, I mean, for example, I'll be the gingerbread, even though it was locked down, I could have written so much more, um, but I had the deadline. So I had to submit my, my book when I submitted it. But it's when you start unpicking a subject, it can take you down so many different avenues. I mean, I, I could probably, I mean, I, I've, didn't, I've been to Cornwall many times in my life, but I, I'm really now in love with Cornish food. And I'd love to write a book on Cornish food, which has been done, I know, loads of times before, but I'm absolutely fascinated by it, the pasties and everything down there. It's just such a wonderful it, culture. And we were talking about the pasties, I'm sorry, yeah. before we were, because in the Upper Peninsula in Michigan, there is a pasty tradition. I think it started with the, well, whatever, the Finns and the Corns, whichever group showed up first, but there's been a long pasty tradition up there yeah. related to the miners. Yeah, so I so I could, I, I would love to come back and do a joint talk with them or, you know, a meeting with them. That would be quite fabulous because it's, I there's so much more I think I could um, find out about Cornish food. And it, it's so, so hard when you're, you know, that their archives are amazing. If you ever have to come over here and do any research at, at the Cornish archives, they are, such lovely people, so helpful and so amazing. There are this brand new building and um, and it's just, I could have spent, I could have, well, I could still be there if I, if, if I hadn't had to get back. If it was for this darn old well, no, it's wearing, alive, but it's, it's social um, distancing, life was led the last two years. It's, um, it's, yeah, I mean, it was an absolute wealth of information. Um, yeah, so I would love to come back and talk more and answer some of these uh, questions um, about saffron. When, uh, and by the way, is this Priya? I see Priya's on the list. Is this our friend Priya from Denmark? Or is it somebody else? Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. This is terrific. Uh, so we'll have you again. And if you don't mind putting your thinking thing, I would love to find a speaker on Elizabeth David. So if you know of anybody. Just think about that. Uh, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, is, do you know Jill Norman? No. Is that the person who was her editor? Yeah. Geraldine, okay, would, I, be, Geraldine would be good. Um, although I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether she might be better on Jane Grigson, who is amazing. Oh, the, the two of them together are terrific. Uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, Geraldine or Jill, I, I don't know how much stuff she's doing online now, but um, Jill obviously was her editor. Um, uh, you know Elizabeth, right? So, uh, so I, I only know her from reading her books. Okay, so uh, you mean you, you know? I'm uh, sorry, Elizabeth Duard. I mean. Oh you? yeah, I do. Yeah, uh, and, and I and I mentioned it to her. I think, and I misplaced it, but she, I think she mentioned Jill Norman right off the bat. Jill, Jill would be, I think, um, certainly probably the best person because she she worked so closely with Elizabeth so she obviously knows Elizabeth very well and she was um I think she was quite involved in that aspect of the Denny exhibition at Raynham Hall so um yeah it was she would probably be best I mean I know I've, I've written on Elizabeth David a lot but uh well, you have I've done a few articles, say a lot. I've done a few articles, and obviously I did a lot of research for the supper club. Um, but uh, I'll send you the menu. Well, let me let me put it to this way: in, in the United States, it's very easy to find somebody to talk about Julia Child. Okay, but that's because it's, it's here. But yeah. it's but to, to, to hear anybody do a talk on Elizabeth David or Jay Grigson doesn't doesn't happen. Well, yeah. thank you so much. We'll let you return to your life, which thank is you. what five thirty in the evening for you. It's 5.30, yeah, I've got, I've, uh, I'm in the midst of making a curry. So I, I made a curry and then I was saying to Cathy earlier, I had orange fingers because I'd also made a <laughs> jack recipe that had saffron in it, a very, very odd apricot cake. She tasted better than I thought it was going to. <laughs> but, That's um, always a pleasant surprise, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it was, yeah. And I uh, know I won't forget to put my, this is my favourite night of the year because I get an extra hour in bed and I can legitimately have, I can get up and, I feel like I've had a wonderfully long night's sleep without actually getting up in the morning and thinking, goodness, where's the day gone? Not that By I the way, I, not, not that this is, <laughs> when do you change your clocks? Tonight. When do you, okay. And I think we're next week. I thought it was tomorrow, but I saw something yesterday. I got to double check or I'll screw up my clock. Um, um, you guys are definitely uh, after us because my, as I was saying, my husband, he works in the UK, but he's, um, he works from the, uh, an, 
firm in a, a company that's based in Chicago. He lives in two time zones then. Yeah, so he knows because he gets, he's going to get, I think he gets finished work early because your clocks haven't gone back and hours have or something. I don't, yeah. Yeah, we're next so week. Okay. Pass, cool. pass, so he gets a, like a week of, wait, I can it's an extra hour or something for a whole week <laughs> no. but yeah it was a pleasure meeting you i hope we'll encounter you again yeah and i say uh do let me know if there's anything you want me to send in terms of uh, i'll send you the elizabeth david stuff but i'll send you an email i'll send you an e i'll go through the notes uh, and, and i'll figure it out or anything else um, or if anyone has any questions uh you're welcome to contact me on my website was up there but all contact Catherine, she'll forward my contact details. Absolutely fine for anyone to contact me if they have questions about gingerbread or saffron. So thank you again. I'll try and answer them, but I say Jill's. Jill's uh, don't, don't worry, life is long. Thank you much. Thank you, everybody. And hopefully some of you will come up to, uh, to this talk, this visit into this museum in two weeks. Very good. And Scott's program in between. Thanks much. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Bye. Nice meeting you. Nice meeting you too.